GLJ Shorts. Bashak Chale and Catherine Costello will be presenting their article, Hard Protection Through Soft Courts, non refoulement Mom Before the United Nations Treaty Bodies. The article appeared in the special issue Border Justice, Migration and Accountability for Human Rights Violations in April 2020. In a nutshell, what is your article about? This is an article that I co-authored with Catherine Costello and Stuart Cunningham. The article is about the interpretation of the norm of non-refoulement in international human rights law. Non-refoulement is the norm which says that no individual should be returned to a country where they may face serious risks of human rights violations. In this study, we look at how the non-refoulement norm is interpreted by United Nations human rights treaty bodies. We call these treaty bodies soft courts because they don't emit legally binding judgments. We then look at whether the interpretation of these bodies is different or more activist or more expensive than hard courts. And here we take the example of the European Court of Human Rights. A very surprising and important finding of the study is that soft courts are not more activist in their interpretation of the norm of non-refoulement compared to the European Court of Human Rights. What's at stake and why now? Um, well, our starting point was really just the empirical fact of lots of cases being brought to UN treaty bodies about non-refoulement. Um, and that was across the treaty bodies. Some of them have been interpreting non-refoulement for a long time, others have started more recently. Um, but this was puzzling because a lot of the cases actually are brought against European states. So lawyers and applicants could have brought those cases to the European Court of Human Rights, or at least to national courts relying on the ECHR. So we wanted to understand a little bit better why you would take a non-refoulement case towards a UN treaty body. So this is really important doctrinal comparison to see how the norm is interpreted differently by these different bodies. Um, and we did find there are some striking differences. Um, as Bashak said, it's not the case that the treaty bodies are always vanguard and very loose in their interpretations, but there are some striking differences where, for example, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child took a very different and more protective approach than the European Court of Human Rights when looking at Spanish border practices at its land border in Morocco. Where do we go from here? Well, we hope the article has some uh, practical value because what we reveal is that this body of jurisprudence of over 500 views reveals an important um, institutional and doctrinal layer of protection, um, including for rejected asylum seekers whose claims may have been wrongfully rejected. Um, and I think that's really important because unfortunately in contemporary Europe, we often imagine that a rejected asylum seeker has no international protection needs. Uh, but in fact, a lot of these cases reveal that they do because there's something faulty in the way asylum claims are examined. So that's a very practical implication for lawyers and for asylum seekers themselves. Alongside uh, that uh, practical implication, uh, I think our study will allow all the UN Human Rights Committee members to understand how the other committees are interpreting non refoulement because this is not a world court. There are lots of different committees doing different types of work. We also think that uh, the, the study would allow the hard courts in Europe, in Americas or in Africa to see how the UN human rights system is evolving in its interpretation. The next stage for, for us, what we'd like to pursue next is to take the study from its doctrinal uh, comprehensive analysis to uh, more of a socio-legal dimension. And what we'd like to do is to understand whether the states who receive these soft uh, views from the soft courts, whether they comply with them or whether they treat them differently from judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. What are the most promising developments in society at the moment? Okay, I think I, I received a really tough question in the in the midst of um, of, of, a, of a pandemic. Um, what is cause for hope? I think the, it's it's empathy and it's sort of common understanding and common dialogue, and um, and hopefully increase of more and more solidarity with one another as we go through very diff difficult times um, collectively. 
What small fact about you would people not expect? I don't know. I mean, I, I never decided what I wanted to do when I grow up. Is that an interesting fact? <laughs> Um, I ended up doing law by accident because um, I changed my mind about doing something else. And um, yeah, it's all been a big mistake, um, but a quite productive one. So yeah, liking and hating what you do can be very productive. So that might be useful for some people out there.